tonight. Mixed signals. Israel and Hamas struggle to reach middle ground on ceasefire talks. Now with more warnings of an impending invasion on Rafah, despite global condemnation. Tense times. India-Pakistan relations teeter on the edge of conflict, following fresh accusations on extrajudicial killings in the region. Tit for tat. The Republican and Democrat camps attempt to appeal to swing voters across the nation, with Trump seeing more success with his abortion regulations than Biden's student loan relief. And the Goat Whisperer. How do you catch a furry fugitive? You get some fries. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Anaverna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you very much for taking the time to join us on World News this evening. Really lovely to have you here tonight. The world just witnessed a solar eclipse, but not much has changed over here at World News as we once more continue to bring you key global updates on stories we have followed so far. Starting off, as always, with the Israel-Palestine conflict. Now, contrary to reports from Cairo that an agreement was close to being reached for the ceasefire to the war in Gaza, Israel says an invasion of Rafah is critical to victory in the war and that a date has been set for the invasion. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said on Monday that a date has been set for an invasion of Rafah, where some 1.4 million displaced Palestinians are sheltering. No specific date was disclosed, but Netanyahu's remarks appear in direct opposition to reports that truce talks had seen progress. Earlier on Monday, a state-affiliated news channel in Cairo had reported that truce talks between Israel and Hamas, alongside Qatari and Egyptian mediators on Sunday, had all resulted in agreement on basic points. al Qahira News said a final agreement was expected to be reached within 48 hours. However, contrary to those reports, a Hamas official said no progress had actually been made on a ceasefire for the six-month-old conflict. The Israeli foreign minister had described the Cairo talks on Sunday as the closest the two sides had come to a deal since a short-lived truce in November. But the Israeli prime minister said an invasion of Rafah was required for Israel's victory in this war. Today I received a detailed report on the talks in Cairo. We are constantly working to achieve our goals. First and foremost, the release of all our hostages and achieving a complete victory over Hamas. This victory requires entry into Rafa and the elimination of the terrorist battalions there. It will happen. There is a date. Foreign governments and organizations have spoken out against Israel's plans to launch a Rafah offensive, with a southern city in a desperate condition and an invasion raising fears of further civilian casualties. And on updates on the Russia-Ukraine conflict now, accusations fly off both sides as Russia said Ukraine struck the Zaporizhia nuclear power station controlled by Russian forces three times and demanded the West respond, though Kyiv said it had nothing to do with the attacks. Russian officials at the Moscow-controlled Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine accused Kyiv of using drones to attack one of its reactors on Sunday. Ukraine, however, denied responsibility, with its intelligence agency saying the strikes may have been the work of the Russians themselves. The International Atomic Energy Agency confirmed that there were at least three direct hits against the main reactor containment structures. The agency said this attack did not cause critical damage and the surrounding radiation levels remain unchanged. Nonetheless, its chief warned that nuclear targets should remain off limits. As I said before the UN Security Council and the IAEA Board of Governors, no one can conceivably benefit or get any military or political advantage from attacks against nuclear facilities. This is a no-go. The Zaporizhia nuclear plant is Europe's largest and has been occupied by Russian forces since the start of their 2022 Ukraine offensive. It remains at the front lines as the Ukraine-controlled city of Zaporizhia experiences regular bombing by the Russian military. Although its six reactors have been shut down for months, the plant still requires power and staff to operate its critical cooling systems. 
Uh, still on Russia, we move on from the conflict to a conversation. The nation participated in some cohesive dialogues with China in moves to foster better cooperation on security in the Eurasian region. For more on this story, we have other than world news. Special correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. Minoli, what's the latest? Yes, Anuradi. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said Russia and China have agreed to begin a dialogue on security in the Eurasian region after talks with the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi. Lavrov said at a televised press conference after the talks that the task of forming Eurasian security arises and they have agreed to begin a dialogue with the involvement of other like-minded people on this issue. Lavrov also said that Russia and China would continue their anti-terrorist cooperation. When asked about a reported drone attack on the Russian-controlled Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine, Lavrov said that Russia would seek an honest assessment of the attacks from the UN's nuclear watchdog IAEA and would raise the matter at the UN Security Council. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a world news special correspondent Menoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. Thanks again. And we are still in our region of Asia with quite a curious conversation rolling out between Japan and North Korea. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida says his government is making high level approaches to North Korea for talks with Kim Jong un as he looks to resolve issues such as the abduction of Japanese citizens by the North. The North had earlier dismissed any possibility of a meeting. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has reiterated his determination to secure a meeting with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. During an interview on Sunday ahead of a summit with U.S. President Joe Biden, Kishida said his government is making high-level approaches to hold a Tokyo-Pyongyang summit. He added the purpose of promoting the meeting is to address unresolved issues and promote stable relations apparently referring to the abduction of Japanese citizens in the 1970s and 80s, as well as the North's nuclear and missile development. The Japanese leader also said his government is monitoring military cooperation between North Korea and Russia and called joint military drills between China and Russia concerning with respect to international order and stability. For the past few weeks, Kishida has repeatedly said he wishes to push for a summit to resolve the abduction issue, which has been a main obstacle in Japan's relations with North Korea. As I've said before, to solve the abduction problem and other North Korean issues, a summit is crucial. I have been working directly on realizing this with North Korea through various channels. But late last month, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's powerful sister, Kim Yo-jong, suddenly said the regime would not pursue a summit and that it would reject any contact and negotiations with Japan, accusing Japan of being stuck in the past by continuing to raise the issue of Japanese abductees. In 2002, after years of denial, North Korea acknowledged that it had kidnapped 13 Japanese in the 1970s and 1980s which experts say was most likely to train spies in the Japanese language and culture. The regime apologized and allowed five of them to return to Japan that year, but said the others had died. But Japan says there were at least 17 Japanese citizens abducted and continues to claim that Pyongyang has yet to provide any acceptable explanation. It has been demanding North Korea immediately return all the remaining abductees, with many elderly relatives saying they're running out of time to see their loved ones. If the summit takes place, it will be the first time in more than 20 years that the leaders of North Korea and Japan are meeting, since 2002. The diplomatic ties continue to strain in our immediate vicinity, specifically between India and Pakistan, as the two nations are trading barbs after a news report said that Delhi had carried out at least 20 extrajudicial killings in the neighboring country. India has not officially reacted to the allegations, but the defense minister said that India would kill anyone who escaped to Pakistan after disturbing peace in the country. Pakistan has reacted sharply calling the remarks provocative. Relations reached an all-time low in 2019 when India carried out air strikes on militant camps in Pakistan's Balakot region as retaliation for a suicide attack that had killed 40 troops in Indian-administered Kashmir. The latest flare-up of tensions began after The Guardian in a report claimed that India had been involved in killing at least 20 people in Pakistan since 2020, 
as a part of a broader policy to target terrorists living on foreign soil. It comes at a time when India is weeks away from general elections which are set to be held from 19th April. Pakistan is an emotive issue in India and analysts say that the politicians often use it as a nationalistic pull plank to curry favor with voters. Islamabad claimed it had provided irrefutable evidence linking India to extrajudicial killings in its country and called on the international community to hold India accountable for its legal actions. We're taking a short commercial break now. Stay tuned as we bring you more updates from across the globe. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We return with updates on a tax scandal that took the world by storm almost 8 years ago. 27 people underwent trial for money laundering in connection with the Panama Papers tax evasion scandal which revealed how many of the world's wealthy stashed assets in offshore companies. The revelations in the 2016 Panama Papers sent shockwaves around the world. First in the Central American country itself, which was forced to adopt new legislation against tax fraud. It's thanks to these new laws that the trial in Panama can go ahead. Gracias, podemos tomar así. Among those on trial, the two founders of the now defunct Mossack Fonseca. Mi nombre es Jürgen Mossack. Mi nombre es Ramón Fonseca Mora. The firm's 11.5 million leaked documents exposed a worldwide web of offshore shell companies for influential clients. including the likes of former British Premier David Cameron I want to be completely transparent and open about these things and football star Lionel Messi as well as close associates of Russian president Vladimir Putin Some of the documents show that Mossack Fonseca shell corporations had been used for fraud tax evasion or avoiding international sanctions The leak triggered more scrutiny on tax havens and the opening of judicial and tax investigations around the world Then Pakistani Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif was disqualified for life from office after being implicated in the files and the Icelandic Prime Minister at the time was forced to resign. 5 years after the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists first published the papers, governments around the world had recouped more than 1.3 billion dollars in back taxes and penalties. And on the road to the White House tonight, we see Biden pulling out all the stops to appear like the better choice to younger swing voters. His newest plan targeting student loan relief, but despite the generous measure, demographic support isn't looking as stable for the Biden-Harris campaign. President Joe Biden on Monday announced plans to ease student debt that would benefit at least 23 million Americans. The move addresses a key issue for young voters who support he needs as he prepares for a rematch with Donald Trump in the presidential election this November. Biden detailed the plans in Madison, Wisconsin. It's for the good of our economy. It's growing stronger and stronger and it is. By freeing millions of Americans from this crushing debt of student debt, it means they can finally get on with their lives instead of being put their lives being put on hold. The plans include canceling up to $20,000 of interest for borrowers regardless of income. The Biden administration estimates that would eliminate the entirety of that interest for 23 million borrowers. Progressive voters have long urged the White House to address student loan debt. Despite the US Supreme Court blocking his earlier plan last year, the administration has said it has successfully approved $146 billion in student debt relief for 4 million Americans. Still, many young voters for whom the issue remains a top priority fault Biden for not achieving greater debt forgiveness, and many have concerns about his foreign policy on the war in Gaza. Meanwhile, Republicans have called Biden's student loan forgiveness approach an overreach of his authority. They also say the relief is an unfair benefit to college-educated borrowers, while other borrowers were left high and dry. Biden has vowed to continue pushing student debt relief to as many borrowers as possible.
And now over in the Republican camp, we saw Trump finally taking the time to tout his take on abortion. The introduced policy is surprisingly milder than expected of the former president, as some hardline backers grow a tad bit disappointed by his approach. However, it's very clear that the Trump camp is faring far better than Biden in terms of policy. The states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both and whatever they decide must be the law of the land, in this case, the law of the state. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump said on Monday that abortion laws should be determined by U.S. states, but stopped short of proposing a national ban, an effort seen as a bid to boost his chances in the November election. In a video posted on his social media platform, the former president said he supported exceptions for rape, incest, and to protect the life of the mother. He also reiterated that he supports the availability of in vitro fertilization. But Trump did not back a national ban to prohibit abortions beyond a number of weeks into a pregnancy, disappointing some religious and conservative backers who had hoped he would pursue national limits should he return to the White House. Trump had previously signaled support for an abortion ban beyond 15 weeks, but on Monday said, quote, remember, we must also win elections. A call for a national ban could have hurt Trump's chances in the six or seven U.S. states likely to determine the outcome of November's presidential race. Overall, 57 percent of Americans think abortion should be legal in most or all cases, a March Ipsos poll found. While Trump's statement on Monday aimed to carve out a political middle ground, it drew criticism from both Democrats who favor abortion rights and anti-abortion groups on the right, underscoring the divisiveness around the issue. November's presidential election, which pits Trump against Democratic President Joe Biden, is the first since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in 2022, which had given women the constitutional right to have an abortion. Three of the conservative justices who voted to strike down Roe, which had stood for nearly 50 years, were appointed by Trump. Alluding to those justices, Trump took credit for the Supreme Court's overturning of the landmark decision. In response to Trump's video, Biden on Monday issued a statement saying, quote, Trump is scrambling. He's worried that since he's the one responsible for overturning Roe, the voters will hold him accountable in 2024. Well, I have news for Donald. They will. Well, before we move on, I have to point out that Trump clearly didn't let a good solar eclipse go to waste with the release of a witty video that is sure to leave a mark. Take a look. Speaking of eclipses, the solar spectacle that unfolded over the course of just over four minutes across North America was one that was viewed in awe by many thousands of avid enthusiasts. Here's a roundup of how exactly the totality phenomenon was appreciated in its occurrence. 
North America's first total eclipse in seven years started off in Mexico on Monday. For many, the rare event was moving. Thousands gathered in the beachside resort town of Mazatlan, the first major viewing spot along this year's Path of Totality, a 115-mile-wide stretch from Mexico's Pacific coast through Texas and across 14 other states into eastern Canada. Folks, enjoy the eclipse, but play it safe. Don't be silly. U.S. President Joe Biden reminded social media followers about eye safety as millions of sky watchers gathered all over the U.S. for the celestial display. About 32 million people in the United States live within the path of totality, and many more were able to observe a partial solar eclipse. Crowds in Arlington, Texas cheered as the moon crept slowly but surely in front of the sun, briefly blocking out all but a brilliant halo of light or corona. Onlookers in Millerton, Oklahoma, banged drums as the sky went dark. In Indianapolis, many gathered in the bleachers of the storied Indy 500 racetrack to take it in. It was just insane. We were just talking about how it kind of looks like a pierogi. It looks like a yeah. croissant. In New York City, viewers were in awe and also possibly hungry as coverage reached only 90% totality, making the sun crescent-shaped. <laughs> and eclipse enthusiasts in Niagara Falls in Ontario, Canada, broke a Guinness World Record for most people dressed like the sun. The period of totality lasted up to four and a half minutes depending on the observer's location, surpassing the one in 2017 which lasted upwards of two minutes and 42 seconds. According to NASA, solar eclipse totalities can range from 10 seconds to about seven and a half minutes. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Stay tuned. Welcome back. With the rapid emergence of generative AI and related tech, the wonders are also cause for worry in some instances, especially for creatives like artists who have had countless close calls with AI taking their creative liberties. Well, sometimes you just have to fight fire with fire. And in this instance, tech with tech. I do sketches and paintings every day. That's my full-time job. Not only is Carla an artist, but she's also a huge advocate for protecting artists' rights in this new age of AI. She's part of a class action lawsuit alleging copyright infringement by several generative AI companies. In the meantime, she's protecting her work using a tool made at the University of Chicago, where a ragtag team of professors and PhD students are embarking on a very bold mission to poison artificial intelligence models. Ben Zhao, Heather Jang, and their team are capitalizing off how AI models read images. For example, if you ask a model to create an image of a dog from scratch, it's going to look at hundreds, thousands, millions of photos of a dog to train itself on what dog looks like. Enter Nightshade, which hopes to make that 0%. For artists like Ortiz, it offers protection. It might be impossible to stop AI models from scraping her work, but with Nightshade, she can mess up the way they see it. And finally tonight, a police officer has many roles they have to take on in order to step up in an hour of need. It could be valiant like fighting flames or in this case, borderline slapstick comedy. As two animal friends went on the loose, making it this officer's job to wrangle them back home. Take a look. Some say it's all in a day's work, but it's safe to assume this Texas police officer didn't see wrangling a goat and a peacock in his line of duty. This is Officer Turner from the Irving Police Department. Officials say he started his day patrolling the city, but ended up getting two calls that might have been better suited to animal control. That's a goat running down Interstate 83. At first, Officer Turner used Burger King french fries to lure the goat in, but that didn't work. The goat took off through a parking lot, followed by Officer Turner and his co-workers. The goat didn't make it easy for them. Good job, goat wrangler. 143 today. 
We got to go. Less than a half an hour later came another call that probably sounded like an April Fool's Day joke. A loose peacock strutting its way through a neighborhood needed to be removed. That's right. Yeah. Grabbing this peacock took less effort than the goat, but then the real trouble started. How do you fit a peacock's tail into a patrol car? Oh, I'll just, I'll set it in here and then I'll, yeah. Uh, Two animals detained in one day isn't easy, but there's always time for a selfie. Well, I guess goat or human, we simply cannot resist a good bit of fries. I certainly can't. Clearly, the officer understood the way of a true foodie. Well, that's all the stories we have to report to you on World News Tonight. We'll join you again tomorrow to bring you key updates from across the globe. Till then, good night.